Hello, my name is Mark Temple. This is a presentation in the InBrief series on cancer genetics. And in this mini lecture, I'll be talking to you about tumor suppressor genes. So in a previous lecture, I was talking to you about oncoproteins. And if you remember with, um, so I'm gonna do a bit of a comparison between oncoproteins and tumor suppressor genes. Now, don't forget you've got two copies of every gene in the genome. So with oncoproteins, you mutate one copy, that can become hyperactive, and therefore you're gonna see the effect of that mutation. Because oncoproteins are proteins that are driving cell growth, and when you hyperactivate them, they drive cell growth even more, despite the fact that there's a good copy of the onco gene there, or the onco protein there, the mutated copy can dominate. Now that's different for tumor suppressor genes. Tumor suppressors work by suppressing the growth function of, 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 of cells, okay? So if you knock out, mutate one copy of the tumor suppressor, you've still got the other copy there that's gonna suppress the growth. So with tumor suppressors, you've got to knock out both copies of the genes before you see an effect. Okay, and that's really distinct from um, oncoproteins. So as long as a cancer cell um, is missing the tumor suppressors, it's going to grow in a malignant fashion. You can do experiments where you return the wild type to the cell and then it, you stop the growth characteristics that's abnormal and the cell returns to normal growth. So the wild type copy is dominant over the mutated copy. So effectively then, because you need to knock out both copies of the tumor suppressor to see the effect, it's unlikely to happen. So when people first started thinking about tumor suppressor genes in, in the 1970s, it was like, well, no, tumor suppressor genes is, are unlikely because it's so improbable to knock out two copies of the same gene in the same cell. Okay, so the probability of knocking out a gene by mutation, you know, it's 10 to the 6 per gene, effectively. You know, if, if you do the maths with, you know, 6 billion base pairs and, you know, 30,000 genes, you can work out some sort of simple stats on these things. And you can say, well, it's highly unlikely to knock out both copies of these genes in the same cell. But it happens. So what's going on? So um, Nutson kind of helped um, helped us understand this process. So he, he came up with this, you know, I guess we refer to it as um, loss of heterozyg heterozygosity. So I'll explain what heterozygosity is and I'll explain some processes in the cell where you can lose that and therefore lose the second copy of the tumor suppressor gene. So he was studying retinoblastoma, which is a disease or a cancer of the eye that occurs in um, newborn infants and, and children. And there's two types of retinoblastoma. There's unilateral and bilateral, so one eye and two eye. Now, if you've got a familiar history of, you know, if it occurs in the family, then the occurrence of the, 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 the disease is consistent with, with a single random mutation knocking out the, the good copy because you've inherited a bad copy. If it's a sporadic occurrence, then you've got to knock out both um, copies. It's, it's much more unlikely for that to occur and you tend to have unilateral retinoblastoma when that occurs because it only occurs in one group of cells in the body rather than, than um, you know, um, all, all of the cells um, being affected. So with um, familiar retinoblastoma, you inherit a mutant copy, you have a sporadic mutation to the other copy, and you get bilateral retinoblastoma. If you have no family history, you'd, you have to have a somatic mutation in one cell, and then during, I guess, you know, embryo development, because it's a, a, a disease that often, is often seen in newborn infants, then during um, you know, a, a, a small gestation period, you've got to pick up a second copy in another, um, in, in the same cell 
that's going to then lead to the, the disease. And this tends to be unilateral because of the nature of the two mutations, and it's, and it's more rare uh, as well than it is if you've got um, a family history. So it was proposed that the first copy of the gene was knocked out through mutation, and then the second copy of the gene was knocked out by another process. Okay, And this was a non-mutational event leading to the knockout of the second copy of the gene. So before we look at what the other process is, let's have a really quick refresher on, um, on, on cell division. So, um, so, so during the cell cycle, you get um, a DNA synthesis phase, which is the S phase here, and you get um, replication of the chromosomes, and then you get segregation of these chromosomes. So during segregation, you, can, you have one chromosome pairing with another to give this combination. If you, if you do your basic school level um, analysis of this, then either way you segregate the chromosomes, you're going to have a good copy and a bad copy. Okay. Now, what they worked out that was happening in cells was that um, there was a mitotic recombination event occurring meaning that before segregation of the chromosomes there was a crossover between these different chromosomes leading to these hybrid chromosomes okay so you've still only got the um the you've got one mutation which is being copied typically that would be lost in the segregation but because of this crossover event when you do the segregation on the crossed over or the you know the recombined um chromosomes you get um, a segregation whereby if you if you look at this pairing first if you take the the left and the right to give this and then you take the the, the middle ones to give this then in that instance you're good you still got a good copy of the gene but then when you take the um, left left here and the right right and that's where it gets bad so if if you do this the segregation analysis after this mistake that's happened during um you know during cell a normal cell process such as mit mitotic recombination that's led to a situation where the segregation of the chromatids now can give two bad copies of the original mutation in a cell and then that cell is going to have a growth characteristic that's faster okay or it's at least a step towards a cancer having knocked out both copies of this tumor suppressor in the cell. So the first one was knocked out through a mutational event, and the second one was um, was effectively lost through this mitotic recombination event. And then the segregation of the chromatins put the two into mutations into the same cell. Okay, so this is what normally occurs during segregation, and this is what happens during segregation because after you've had that um, mitotic recombination. So this here is, occurs at a higher rate than, you know, the, the rate of mutation of one gene, you know. So the, I think this happens at a frequency of 10 to the 4, minus 4, whereas the mutation is 10 to the minus 6, if you, you know, is what the textbooks tend, tend to say. So having lost the good copy of the gene, this is referred to as loss of heterozygosity. So previously you had a good copy and a bad copy, now you have your now you have um your your homogeneous for the two bad copies so you've lost that um, heterozygosity so there are other processes in the cell that can also lead to a, a loss of heterozygosity um, so during DNA synthesis the um, polymerase can um, jump between the different um, template strands and effectively copy the the, um, the 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 mutant gene onto the chromosome that doesn't have the mutation. So effectively, if this is the the good copy and here's the bad copy with the mutation, the polymerase, whilst copying one strand, can bounce and jump onto the other strand and then come back. So effectively, this mutation is transferred onto 
one of the copies and therefore again you've lost the wild type copy and one of the, the giveaways that this is happening is that the mutation that occurs on one strand is identical to the mutation that occurs on the other strand okay so it's not as if a mutations occurred in the same gene which might be you know 30,000 base pairs it's occurred at the same base pair the same position within those 3,000 base pairs because you know, renoblastoma is a big gene so th this this identical mutation on the different strands was a dead giveaway that there was some process happening and then when they looked at it in more detail they worked out that there were these different mechanisms that can give rise to the loss of heterozygosity so the loss of the wild type copy um, and the duplication of the mutated copy so that you have two bad genes in the cell and therefore the wild type's not going to dominate because there is no wild type and the tumor suppressor function is lost and the cell can then grow in an uncontrolled way. There's another way you can knock out um, a, a gene and that's through reducing the expression of that gene. And there's an epigenetic um, change that occurs in DNA, which is DNA methylation. Uh, methylation, um, occur when it occurs in the promoter region of genes, it, it can actually shut down the effect of the promoter. So effectively, you're not going to get expression of that gene. So, um, so DNA, so methyl groups, DNA methylation is the addition of methyl groups to the DNA bases, and it's the cytosine bases that get methylated. Okay, so a cytos cytosine that's adjacent to a, a, um, a guanine. So at these um, C G sequences, these the cytosine can be methylated. And this is a very common sequence, so there's lots of sites in the genome where this can occur, but a lot of the tumor suppressor genes, I'm not sure why, but the tumor suppressor genes, they have GC-rich promoter regions. So their promoter regions are particularly susceptible to methylation, so because they've got these GC-rich regions in, in the um, promoter region. I guess GC rich regions don't occur in exons because it's difficult for them to code for meaningful amino acid sequences, but you know, promoters are less constrained since they're not coding for um, amino acid sequence. So how does DNA methylation or methylation of tumor suppressor promoters, how does that turn off the gene expression? Okay, now to understand that, you've got to think about another layer of um, cell biology coming into play, which is the activity of histone deacetylase enzymes. Okay, so you need to have a bit of an understanding of um, DNA in cells is compacted into nucleosomes. The nucleosomes are proteins with the DNA wrapped around it, and this DNA can be wrapped around tightly or loosely. And if it's wrapped around tightly, it's difficult to express and, and to, to um, express that gene. If the DNA is wrapped around these nucleosome cores loosely, then it's easier to express that DNA. Okay? The histone deacetylase enzymes affect the packaging of the DNA around the nucleosome core. So, um, so the, the so when you have methylated CPG islands in promoters, these um, can be bound by enzymes called histone deacetylases. When the histone deacetylase binds, it can remove these ac acetyl groups from the nucleosome, the proteins in the nucleosome. And when you remove the acetyl groups, you effectively increase the charge of the amino acid side chains, side chains that can then bind to the negatively charged DNA. Um, I haven't got time to explain this, it's, it's another lecture in itself, but I've, I've done a quick animation here to try and help. So what I've drawn here is the DNA strand wrapping around a nucleosome. So this is um, a protein um, disc, if you like, with DNA wrapped around it. Now, if these proteins are acetylated, meaning that the, the lysine residues, which are normally um, positively charged, 
if they've got acetyl groups attached to them, they need, they're not positively charged. And I think we all know that the DNA backbone is negatively charged. So when you add the acetyl groups, you loosen the binding of, of the DNA because you haven't got that um, charge interaction. So you can express, it's thought that this DNA is lightly packed and therefore it favors transcription. When you methylate the CPG islands that occur on the DNA, then the methylated DNA allows the binding of this protein, the histone deacetylase. Now that, the deacetylase, when it binds here, it's going to remove these acetyl groups. So effectively, the methylation is bound by the histone deacetylase. The histone deacetylase removes the acetyl groups. So once you've re removed the acetyl groups from the proteins of the histone octama, then you've removed it from lysine residues. So the lysine residues return to the positive charge. The DNA backbone is negatively charged. You get a strong association between the, um, the proteins and the DNA. And therefore, because of the methylation, because of the histone deacetylase, because of the removal of the acetyl groups, you get a more compacted chromatin structure, DNA structure, and this blocks transcription. And because tumor suppressors are very GC rich, this occurs at the promoters of the, of the tumor suppressors turning them off. So it's another way which you lose the good copy of the tumor suppressor gene. It's not through mutation, it's because the gene's not expressed. So effectively then what's happening in this diagram I was just showing you is that you go from um, a tumor suppressor gene that's being expressed in loosely packaged DNA to a tumor suppressor that can't be expressed because the DNA is tightly packaged. And this is just another um, schematic showing that. So in normal cells, you don't have the methylation of these um, cytosines. Therefore, you've got open DNA, you've got gene expression. When you get methylation of these um, cytosines, you get the histone deacetylase binding, removing the acetyl groups, tightening up the structure of DNA and therefore turning the gene off. So the important message I was trying to get across in, in relation to methylation is effectively that methylation at promoter region of tumor suppressor genes turns them off. So the, 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 the initial conundrum was tumor suppressor genes, you've got to knock out both copies. It's unlikely to occur in the same cell by mutation alone, but it occurs. So what's, what's happening? You get one mutation and then you get a loss of heterozygosity of that mutation through those methods I've told you. But, and also you get DNA methylation, which is of which the tumor suppressor promoters are particularly susceptible. And that leads to the inactivation of gene expression of, of the um, tumor suppressors. And therefore, um, effectively you've knocked out the other copy. Okay, well I hope that give you, gave you a little bit of an understanding of um, tumor suppressors and the difficulty in conceptualizing, well, how can that occur? And it occurs, the, the genetics of it is through these other cellular process, processes that lead to the knocking out of the dominant wild type copy. Okay, I hope that's been of some help to you. Thank you for listening.